Hey everybody, my name is Paul Leston Jr., a.k.a. Boy Green. I'm the New York Jets digital reporter for Heavy.com. Welcome to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash boygreen25. And before you go any further, since you stopped by, first off, thank you and welcome to the family, whether a new member or an old. Make sure you like the video. Hit subscribe down below. It's a free way for you to contribute and uh, be a part of uh, give a part of this. Uh, throughout this entire show. So feel free to show your support in any way that you can. And one way you can is, again, liking the video and hitting subscribe. Let's uh, start off the show with uh, paying some bills. We've got to give a shout-out to our sponsor that makes this possible. He's a fellow New York Jets fan, and this is what he does. If you're curious about real estate or creating wealth through real estate business, our friends at XV Community hold a free weekly Zoom call for the public with a different seven-figure earner on as a guest every week. You can connect with peers, learn from uh, guests, and, of course, ask questions. They do this absolutely free. XV Community is one of the best lineups every week in real estate investing. If you want to go fast, you go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. Learn more about them below at Rojo Sharp Instagram, link down in the bio. Also, you can sign up for that free weekly Zoom call and let them know that Boy Green sent you for all the latest. Again, that is our good buddy, Roshan Joshi. But with that being said, it's time to preview the New York Jets and the Green Bay Packers matchup. One that is tantalizing in more ways than one and two dive in on this matchup i'm going a good buddy of mine that i know very well but i know a lot of my fans do not so let's bring him in his name is joe bartle of rotowire.com his uh, day job is working the all kinds of things fantasy football you can hear him on serious radio talking fantasy football and so much else but also a diehard green bay packers fan so the perfect guy to bring in to break all things down so let's bring him in Joe Bartle, who joins me every Friday in Syracuse on my radio show, The Man Child Show, with me, Boy Green, talking fantasy at 1030. What's up, Joe? Yeah, this is a different 1030 that we're uh, talking a little bit later in the <laughs> evening, but I'm excited. This is this is Packers-Jets. This is going to be a good yeah. conversation. Uh, a good game, too, unfortunately. You know, when we had – I'm sure you do this as well. You're projecting the schedule at the beginning of the season. Right. You're doing the, the W's and L's as you're going through it. Okay, you look at the Jets in Lambeau week six. Yeah, that's a, that's a win for sure. And right. uh, I think I would have said the same thing last week as well, too, if it not for the travel to London. I don't think you could say any of that anymore. I, I think the Jets have been playing incredibly well, way better than we would probably anticipate entering the season. And conversely, I'm not sure what we have in the Packers at the moment. And that has me concerned overall for this matchup. I'm going to it. So I have a bit more stakes on the line. Like this is my first game of the season. Um, I will say that you know I'm ready to blow my lungs out uh, yelling against you guys, but I think this is going to be a competitive game, and that makes me a little bit worried. And, and Joe, let's uh, dive into there before we get into all the uh, Packers stuff in terms of the X's and O's and everything for the game. Normally, for people, and uh, I've gotten a lot of fans who really appreciate this segment where you go behind enemy lines and bring someone from the other side to get that other perspective heading into a game. People have loved the series. Normally, I will say the modus operandi, at least this year, through all the guests of the first five weeks of the season, is whoever I'm bringing on works for an SB Nation affiliate, a fan-sided affiliate, ESPN. They have something with them. They're like, oh, the Ravens wire, the this, the this, the that. For mm -hmm. you, your day job is fantasy football. That's what you bring to the table. But on top of that, you, you kind of bring it in the same realm as me in a different light that, like my radio show, I'm just supposed to be a guy talking radio, but I'm a diehard Jets fan, and that kind of comes mm -hmm. into it. It seems like the same way for you for your Green Bay Packers fandom. Where does that come from? Give us any uh, stories about that that you can. Yeah, I've been working at RotoWire now for the past seven years, um, and I, I think we've developed now from a fantasy sports perspective where it's not just – nerds and basements drinking Mountain Dew and eating Cheetos, right? I mean, I know you right. play fantasy a ton too. Yes. You're in your investors. We're, we are knowledgeable as a community when I say fantasy community, but I, I think just overall people are more knowledgeable. There's more ways to get information when it comes to the NFL and there's more ways to consume the NFL too. And in that way, it's, it's been great since like 1990, right? The NFL's pushed us to be able to be more educate our audience. And I think that's important. So while I cover fantasy football, I mean, in reality, you're, you're watching football to make sure you're getting the correct calls for fans and everything else. I'm more familiar with the Packers and probably the Chargers because the team I actually cover specifically for the RotoWare or for RotoWare uh, on top of just doing all my media work on the side. So I, 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 I've been a fan of the Packers now, uh, probably since the day I was born. We have a, a children's book, and this is important to me because my kid is 15 months old. I know you have a young one as well, too. So yes. we're, we're in the process of raising our kids to be fans of our teams. And I look back and say, so how did my dad successfully get me to be a Packers fan? Okay, we had a book with my face in it, and I was catching touchdowns from Brett Favre. Things. So I've been, I've been a fan of the Packers since day one, uh, season ticket holder with my dad now 
Uh, I think the first game I remember I went to was eight. I still, I still, to this day, one of the worst memories of my life has been my dad choosing not to bring me to the Vikings Packers game. I want to say in 2004 when Antonio Freeman caught the ball off his, uh, off his knee uh, yeah. against the Vikings. That was a Monday night football game. I was too young to go. I couldn't go. I stayed up and watched the whole darn thing. And I still got to celebrate when my dad got home. Uh, anyway, so that's, uh, I mean, like I've been a fan through and through. And again, educated fan, I think, uh, in a lot of ways. When we do the radio show and you're asking me about Jets players, I'll often cheat and just defer to you, right? Like I think it's sometimes <laughs> right. when you're so smart about a certain team, you're aware of what's going on. And even though it's a fantasy sports thing, I, I feel really confident with my knowledge of the Packers. And um, uh, like I said, I, I'm nervous for this matchup. I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't lie to you. I, I think this could be a very competitive game, and I would not have guessed that a month and a half ago. Yeah, 100%. And it's funny that, again, when you go before the season, because back in May, so, you know, that's when the schedule comes out in this post-COVID right. world. When the schedule came out, I did a live stream, and I didn't want to see the, the Jet schedule ahead of time. I just wanted to see it live, and then we're going on the live stream. We're all going to walk through it together, as far as I was <laughs> concerned, and, and walk through it, give my raw take, basically, on it. And, again, because uh, I'm Jets guy, perhaps that's why, I don't know, I said nine, 9 and 8. I could see 9 and 8, and I went through the okay. whole schedule and saw it, and a lot of Jets fans are like dude you're an idiot like what are you talking this is another <laughs> five and twelve season like obviously mm -hmm. and uh so obviously as we, we were kind of going through these games but before as we were going through the games in may i went like oh wow trip to lambo and trip to denver because again russell yeah. also was yeah, just yeah. traded mm -hmm. so and these are the next two games for the new york jets and last year with Teddy Bridgewater, again, a lesser quarterback than Russell Wilson, or we thought uh, you know, in the offseason, <laughs> I guess, is that the Jets got blown out by the Broncos. So 26 nothing. That's what happened last year. So that one looked daunting. And then obviously Lambeau, iconic, historic. I so want to go to Lambeau one day. I should have went for uh, this game. That would have been cool. But uh, <laughs> but these two games, you're right, that a lot of people went, Whoa. Well, we'll see what happens in those games, even the most optimistic of us. But now we get to this point, Joe. And I look at this game and I'm like, man, I can see it. And it's not even like I feel like I'm doing all kinds of backflips to see it. Oh, before, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So but before we get there, let's get the path of the Packers here. When I look at the schedule and thankfully or luckily, because the Packers have played in all these prominent games, I've seen a lot of Packers games mm -hmm. this year. And the only blowout that I remember on the schedule and I didn't even think it was a blowout when I was watching the game was Packers bears. They won technically by 17, but when I was watching the game, it felt like the bears at any moment could have seized the moment. And we're in that game. That oh, was yeah. the only blowout Joe. So why it's Aaron Rodgers? I know they don't have Devontae Adams, but is that the reason that there's been such a detriment or what is it? Yeah, I think it's, I think it's twofold. And if you listen to Packer Nation and read anything that anybody's saying, fans or experts or analysts, otherwise, I, I think we are all kind of up in arms about it. Uh, yes, Rodgers has not played well. I mean, back to back MVP, you're, you're expecting a bit of a, a step right. down. That, that's going to happen, especially when you lose your all pro receiver and possible Hall of Famer and Devonta Adams. Like that, that was natural. You replace him with Christian Watson, the second round pick, and then Romeo Dobbs, a fourth round pick. And throughout training camp, we we were assuming Romeo Dobbs actually was going to be the guy. It was Alan Lazard and then Romeo Dobbs. Romeo Dobbs had had a good two or three week stretch in the middle of the preseason where it's like, wow, this guy might be something special. And then kind of tailed off, had some drops problems towards the end of training camp. And there was a little bit less fire underneath the uh, possible hype train for him. And then Christian Watson, the second round pick, really didn't end up practicing until the last week or so and a half of the training camp. And has been, I think, slowly assimilated into the offense. But what we're seeing is it's not just the rookie wide receivers, but the offensive line. David Bakhtiari is back after about a two, about a two year absence. It feels like due to that knee injury. Uh, and then you have Elgin Jenkins, who was an all pro two years ago. He's back from his knee injury. They're, they're slowly working things better at the offensive line. And for many years, especially with Aaron Rodgers, the offensive line for the Packers has been a strength. I wouldn't say it's a strength, but it's not a negative at, at this point right now. And that's probably the, the big promise that I'm hoping like, okay, the offensive line, if it solidifies and, and Bakhtiari gets to be Bakhtiari and Elgin Jenkins is Elgin Jenkins. This is a contract year for Jenkins too. That's going to be the reason why the team wins and loses. Okay. So then that's one facet. The other part of it's the rushing attack, Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon. I mean, there was no bones about it. That was going to be the strong suit for the Packers entering the year. And it still has, but I think Aaron Jones leads the league in yards per carry. The issue is he's not getting carries. Uh, they, they have been intentional about taking away his opportunities at, to save him for the postseason. I don't specific matchups. That's the part that I think us as somebody that's outside the coaching staff isn't quite familiar. And we've heard now, I want to say two or three times this season and certainly times last year, uh, Matt LaFleur, for as great of a coach he is, 
man, I got to do better uh, running the ball. Aaron Jones and AJ Dillon are doing great. And I just didn't give enough opportunities. Well, give them the opportunities. You are, you are the coach and the quarter. You're, you're calling the plays. And yet this has been a consistent problem. So offensive line not developing the way that we're hoping for just yet. You have the rookie receiver still getting things in motion and then not utilizing the two-headed attack that's supposed to be good. That's how you have the offense being an issue. And you mentioned the Bears game and that was the blowout of the season. You're right. That game ended up being close. It felt like, especially in the third quarter, when they ran the ball down the field with David Montgomery and Khalil Herbert and had that within a one-score game, then Justin Fields kind of had a turnover. That has been the success. You think about two weeks ago with the Patriots as well. That whole third quarter, it was Damian Harris or Andre Stevenson. That's what pushed in the overtime, plus the, the uncharacteristic pick six. And then last week in London, Saquon Barkley before he got injured. And then after that, you had Matt Breida doing things. It's, it's a concern that the run defense has looked bad. And it doesn't just look bad this year, but it looked bad past years. How many times we lost the Niners in the playoffs? because the running defense is just so bad. And, okay, that was supposed to get better uh, when we changed coordinators. Nope, that's, that's not the same thing. Joe Barry's a, uh, a, a big problem right now. So I think the defense, run defense versus an issue, and then the Joe Barry has been really static in his defensive play calling, and I know that's been a big issue for us overall, and I say us, the Packers. A lot of zone coverage to a fault, right? We saw in week one against the Vikings, Justin Jefferson torched Preston Smith, the outside linebacker and primary pass rusher for us, because for whatever reason, he was in coverage against Justin Jefferson. Okay, maybe that's just a one-week fluke. No, it's been a consistent thing, making guys like Daniel Dimes and uh, uh, Zappi look better than they actually are because you're just doing a play-action rollout. Like, uh, these guys, I mean, oh, Daniel, Daniel Jones has played fine, uh, certainly better than he has in his previous three years. But these aren't quarterbacks that should be dicing up the Packers. And it's the zone coverage in particular, despite personnel that you would think would be good man coverage wise with Jair and Rasul Douglas on Eric Stokes, the second year corner, I think actually is really good uh, and pretty underrated in the league. So uh, Joe Barry, an issue. And I think cumulatively, there's there's three or four things in the offense that could get that need to get fixed out uh, for the Packers to really correct things. And I have to, I'm sure that Packers fans want to talk nothing about uh, Devontae Adams and uh, apparently pushing random cameramen. <laughs> Again, I just have to say this is a random side note that if I'm that cameraman, when I went down, ah, my back, oh, oh my neck, yeah. oh, I am right. milking that. And now Devontae no, no, no. So so I, I know way too many, I know way too many people who are like, oh, that guy was soft for doing that. I'm like, okay whatever you shouldn't go and call police after the fact he's just making sure he's got the bag locked up like it's fine it. yes, don't don't tell me you're gonna punt away 50k because of your pride like stop it like that's that's yeah. like walking fifty thousand dollars of that photographer's gonna get on, on top of it like i i actually uh i i know actually i feel like most of packers nation is happy for Devonte adams he got a lot of money got to go play with his best friend in his hometown, closer to his family. No one really has any animosity. We got a first round pick out of it. It wasn't like it was a bad deal for us. Yeah, sure. Uh, and I think Devontae Adams is a really good person. So to me, this doesn't really cloud his character at all. Uh, at the same time, he made a bad choice and we all make bad choices from time to time. So I, 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 I have no fault whatsoever with the photographer and anybody who's saying otherwise is just dumb. That's, that's my two cents of the matter. I'm glad that we clarified that because you'll have to give it to our intern, Mark, uh, on our Friday radio show. He's younger. That's recording. the problem. All, yeah. Everyone yeah, under 20 years yeah. is like, oh, yeah, I'm not going to do that. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, grow up, pal. Yeah, look at the bag. Try to secure it. <laughs> uh, that's the key. Uh, and again, I'm sure you Packers fans don't want to talk about the Devontae Adams situation anymore. But I just have to ask, when Aaron Rodgers decided to come back, because again, from the outside, mm -hmm. not inside Packers Nation, like his decision to come back or not, was directly affiliated to Devontae Adams. Like if Aaron Rodgers got the kaboot, like maybe the Packers then could say, all right, maybe we can launch away Devontae Adams and then do something else. Or that would be the only opportunity. I thought there was a negative chance if Devontae, or excuse me, if Aaron Rodgers returned and they figured everything out, that Devontae Adams, of course he was coming back. Uh, there, there's no way that he wouldn't come back if Aaron Rodgers was there. So when Aaron Rodgers started to come back and then Devontae Adams is traded and I'm like, what? And then Aaron Rodgers, mm -hmm. apparently that he knew from right. again, outside, they knew that, yeah, if I was coming back, that he was not like all that stunned me. Like, did that stun Packers people? Was that supposed to happen? Like, man, that's stunning stuff. So I guess I'll, I'll unpack it a little bit. If Please it was do. up to me and Joe Bartle is the GM of the Packers, mm -hmm. there is never going to be a higher value for Aaron Rodgers on the trade market at 38 years or 39 years or whatever he is. Yeah. Than, than this off season. I, I, cause we had him under avoidable contract with the, the, the option to trade Aaron Rodgers was a thing. And people in the, you know, they're talking into the ESPN, whatever they, they, it's like, Oh, you get to cut him or whatever. No, that you had the option to trade him. 
that would have been my choice. And maybe you don't get whatever the package is for a back-to-back -back MVP. I understand that. Uh, they would have been playing at a disadvantage. The Packers would have if they had made that kind of trade. But look at the package Russell Wilson got. Like you're telling me the Packers couldn't have gotten something close to that. I, I think you draft Jordan Love in the first round to eventually get to this point. And to me, the re-signing of Aaron Rodgers was an affirmation that Jordan Love has not progressed the way they thought he would and that he's not going to amount to much. So if you're able to trade Jordan Love for a bag of Cheetos, that's that's kind of like, okay, great. Sounds that's fine to me because I think that was more or less uh, the nail in the coffin for that type of move. And fine, that was the wrong choice back in 2020, whatever it was. But we have to continue on with what we're doing now and trying to build a Super Bowl winner. So you re-sign uh, Aaron Rodgers. I agree. I would have thought Devonta Adams would be right back. It, it matters to me that Rodgers knew, uh, and Rodgers self-reported this. So maybe you could be like, okay, did the general manager in the front office uh, and, and my, uh, Murphy, uh, who is really like the um, owner of the Packers, but not because of us, the fans are, yeah, um, right. did Mark Murphy tell Rodgers you have to say that? I, I don't I don't know. I don't know if I can guess Rodgers' character necessarily, but something tells me there's no man upstairs that is going to tell Rodgers what to say or do. He's going to make the option. And Correct. Do it. So I, I think when he's saying, I knew about Devontae Adams wanting to go to the Raiders, this has been in the works already. I believe that. Um, I, I think he has such confidence in himself and why not that he's thinking I will be able to build up whatever we have, whether it be Randall Cobb or, uh, you know, like Winfrey, who's I think our, our fifth receiver, sixth receiver, much less whatever rookies I might end up getting. Oh, we're going to sign Sammy Watkins, which I do believe he probably was aware of as well, too. Um, OK, yeah, th this will be fine. I can make it work. I'm Aaron Rodgers. And he, I think he actually has, other than the, he has to play within the scheme. That's important. The deep ball has obviously been missing. You watched last week's game uh, in London. That was like bad, bad deep ball by Aaron Rodgers. But so what? So you average one of the lowest yards per target in the league. I think when you have a scheme and an effective rushing attack like Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, you can make that work. It, this isn't like a, a boomer bust guy throw the ball 60 yards down the field every time NFL anymore. Like, just get make sure you're ahead of the chains. And that's really what the Packers have been doing the last three years under Matt LaFleur and have been successful. This is no different. He just lost the back shoulder fade uh, guarantee first down. Like that, That's really all it has been with Devontae Adams. So I, I was surprised, uh, but I was confident, probably wrongfully so, in the front office for improving the pass catchers. And I really didn't think they would draft guys for whatever the reason they don't. I thought they'd be able to get something for agency. There have been rumors that Allen Robinson was considered. There have been rumors that DJ Chark had been considered. They never really uh, ended up getting either one of those guys. Maybe that looks like a good news with Allen Robinson and the Rams so far. Uh, I think the jury's out in Chark. But uh, that, that was my thought, that they'll sign somebody for agency. And that really never came to fruition other than Sammy Watkins. Yeah, let's go to, uh, I heard this, uh, I do this other podcast on uh, Wednesdays. It's called The Boy Green and Buffalo Show. He's another uh, Jets content creator. And he said, the Aaron I really fear is Aaron Jones, not Aaron Rodgers. Mm. And it was it got a sizzling hot take in the uh, Jets uh, social <laughs> media realms. But I'm going to be honest, Joe, I want to ask you about the usage because I heard people were criticizing about the A.J. Dillon usage apparently in London. And then mm -hmm. the hashtag Matthew Berry, you know, a shout out to the fantasy overlord, the free Aaron Jones movement. Like, <laughs> what is up with the usage in general? Because, again, uh, from the outside, uh, which I have to continue to say, the one two dynamic of those two seems so fantastic. And and again, I remember uh, A.J. Dillon in ACC country here locally in Syracuse, again, for mm -hmm. B.C., that 250 pounder. And Aaron Jones, again, seems like one of the most underrated playmakers in the NFL. Like you look at these two and you're like, that's the offense. But at the same time, there has been the strange usage. Why? I don't know. <laughs> and, and, and that's the issue. Is that <laughs> right. Matt LaFleur, Matt LaFleur has been saying the same thing after the game, two or three times already this season, we should have gave the ball guy, given them the ball more. Okay, great. Do it then. Like yeah, you, you're the you guy. are literally, right. you are literally in charge of this. I admire that the fact that he, LaFleur is, uh, able to recognize the mistakes and admit them after the fact. This is not the same as Nathaniel Hackett, who uh, on fourth and two, right in week one, made that ridiculous choice to kick the field goal. Like that's that's just being dumb, and like you you needed to admit you were being dumb. This is one of those conscious choices the floor is making to not run the ball. Now, my one question is is mm -hmm. is it not? LaFleur that's making the wrong call. So here's here's the thing with the Packers offense is that they put a lot of the trust in Aaron, Aaron Rodgers. And again, rightfully so. There are so many run pass options that are available in each play and the receivers are coached and trained for that. We saw at the end of the Giants game, both of those uh, past two passes that were deflected were run pass options. I can see what the, uh, what Rodgers is seeing. Lazard, single coverage. Uh, my guy is six foot four, 230 pounds. He's a box out machine. I will hit Lazard to the game winning touchdown. 
or whatever, and we, we will make this work. Okay, it gets the fucking same pass before as well uh, on the play before. Those were runs, and if you watch the play back, uh, you had Josh Myers, the center for the Packers, completely obliterate the Giants' defensive tackle off the line of scrimmage. That was a walk-in first down, much less possibly a touchdown. That has been a continuous issue for the first five weeks. So is that Aaron Rodgers trying to hero ball it, try to back-to-back MVP this thing? Or is it more like uh, Matt LaFleur has to take that away from Aaron Rodgers and make sure the running game happens? I, I believe after the criticism that really happened nationally at this point uh, last week in that loss to the Giants, that there's going to be a concentrated effort for Aaron Jones to run the ball and AJ Dillon to run the ball. And Dillon hasn't been great. It's really been AJ, uh, sorry, Aaron Jones. Uh, again, with that 6.4 yards per carry, which leads the league. I, I think the Jets front seven is fine enough that it's not going to be, oh, there goes Aaron Jones, 10 plus yards every time. But he's running with a burst and explosiveness. And the offensive line has been much better at run blocking than pass blocking and opening up those lanes that I do think if Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon, let's just say, run the ball, not just receiving, but run the ball uh, 30 plus times, that would be one of those things that you put in the check mark for the Packers victory to occur. What's the competency of the defense? That to me is really intriguing because uh, heading in, I'm like, oof, that there's a, there seems to be a lot of star talent here. Jair Alexander and, and you have mm-hmm. uh, the kid out of, uh, oh my God, the pass rusher. He's escaping me. Oh, uh, Sean Gary, Gary. Michigan. Yeah, yeah, Sean Gary, yeah, Michigan guy. So again, like there's a lot of talent when you look at a lot of levels of this defense and Rasu Douglas, another shout out to how the Packers mm-hmm. acquired him last year. Like there seems to be a lot of talent, but then I look at some of the analytics, a uh, uh, shout out to uh, sharp football for some of that. Again, the Packers defense is number one when they're not playing against play action, but they're 32nd when they are. And then you mentioned all the running backs that have been going on. Like to have that mm-hmm. drastic dynamic is crazy. The running backs have been going off in recent weeks, which I imagine Brees Hall's got to be looking at his job. So, like, what is the competency of this defense? Because, like, on one hand, I see all the star talent, and then I see some of the numbers, and I'm like, something isn't adding up here. Yeah, so this has been a decade-long problem for the Packers. Again, we talked about the multiple losses to the 49ers in the playoffs because they yeah, can't right. the running game. Uh, we thought, okay, it's Tom Capers' fault. Or, yeah, Mike McCarthy's off the locker room. Okay, we are on our like fourth defensive coordinator and second head coach. This is still an issue. And how? That, that's the issue that I'm running into is how does this happen? On paper, this is the best Packers defense that they have had even before the Super Bowl. I'm thinking back to like wow. the mid-2000s Brett Favre days. On paper – this is the best defense the Packers have had. I think they had seven first round picks on that defensive front 11, which is incredible to think about. And they have obviously committed so many draft resources to that position to this past off season, right? With uh, Quay Walker, the middle linebacker and Devontae Wyatt, the defense tackle hasn't played very much this season, which is fine. Uh, the only reason he'd be playing is if Kenny Clark is out. And I think that's the, the key to this is Kenny Clark has been playing at an all pro level. He's not going to put up the numbers, even like Chris Jones, for example, but he is the fulcrum of the Packers defense. If Kenny Clark is be able to provide interior pass rush, there's going to be issues for Zach Wilson and company all game long. And I think Kenny Clark is one of the best defense tackles in the league. So if you lose to Kenny Clark, you know, it's not that big of a deal. Like he's, he's just that good, but right. that's just allowing Rashawn Gary to be effective. Rashawn Gary has a sack in every one of the games this season. I think he's near the top of the league in terms of sacks overall. The problem ends up being is that Joe Barry, the defensive coordinator for the Packers has been calling so much off two man coverage, like, like cover two, basically like what you do for Tyree kill or Jalen Waddle, but for practice squad or Marcus Johnson of the giants last week, there is no reason for the zone coverage to be as prominent as it was. Jair complained about week one against the Vikings that he wanted to have Justin Jefferson. And then people dunked on him saying, well, he covered a man coverage three times and Jefferson got all three passes. That's not the point. What I think needs to be happening. And again, this is just some fan on the outside. Yeah. Right. There needs to be an aggressiveness, a, a tone set on defense. I can't tell you how many Sundays I've been sitting there in the front of kneeling in the front of this uh, chair, just make a play guys, because it's bend, 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 don't break. Eventually this is the NFL. You're going to break at times. Like that's just what happens. You can't consistently play that bend, bend, don't break defense for an entire season for an entire game, much less. So you have to be hoping somebody makes a play. Often it's been Rashawn Gary, but what happens when he can't get there? The secondary isn't really covering man-wise. And they have the personnel. Again, Rasul Douglas, I think, is a pretty good corner. Jair Alexander is one of the best, even though the stats don't show it. And then Eric Stokes, I think, is a more than confident guy. Now, I was also uh, fooled by Kevin King multiple years ago. I thought (laughs) Kevin King was supposed to be the second coming of uh, Richard Uh, Sherman. That was completely wrong. So I I should say uh, my uh, scouting of (laughs) cornerbacks probably isn't – a hundred percent, but I think Stokes is a good player. So you have three good corners, Amos and Savage. Savage can't make any plays with his hands, but he is a hard hitting guy. And Amos is always there at the right spot. What can go wrong? I think just playing soft too many times, 
takes the teeth out of the defense. Like there's a personality that's missing. Uh, and I, I always think back to Charles Woodson, who I thought was a tremendous leader. Yeah, Julius Pepper in the same locker room too. Those defenses played with aggression, but they played within themselves too and knew what they were able to do. Uh, you lost to Darius Smith uh, this offseason, who I thought really provided a bit more of that teeth and leadership. And he was complaining, like, I understood why the front office did it. But that's the guy. I mean, like, that, that, that's the person they're missing right now to be a bit more aggressive. And I just hope Joe Barry's calling more man coverage. Not, maybe not this matchup, because the, the receivers for the Jets are good. Make, I think the whole offense entirely is just good players uh, in good spots. But I, I would believe that the, uh, the, the Packers personnel would win out over the course of a game, because really, it's 11 people. Again, this is one of the best defenses we've had since 2005. Uh, and I'm surprised with how bad they've been playing for the first quarter of the season. Again, you brought up uh, Charles Woodson, who absolutely should not have won the Defensive Player of the Year. There should have been Revis uh, a couple of years ago, but uh, no, 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 that can't be. That's not. That's oh, not true. Oh, oh, yeah, we have that. Uh, we have that every once in a while. Anytime there's Jets Packers matchup, we bring up like old things of Jets Packers. <laughs> I, I won't get over the nine nothing loss the Jets had on the simultaneous catch rule. We had that twice in the game, or the mm. Geno Smith going off in Lambo. You're like Geno Smith, who by the way is now going off now in 2022, as we all mm. predicted. So uh, there's a lot of that there but i want to get into the connective tissue and i want to find out who is the advantage here joe so we have matt lafleur okay and we have mm -hmm. robert sala as robert sala and matt lafleur both talked about in their individual press conference this week they've both been e in each other's weddings they were former roommates <laughs> uh apparently robert sala just revealed this week he helped matt lafleur get his first nfl job with the houston texans which is cool and of course matt lafleur's little brother mike lafleur is the jets mm -hmm. offensive coordinator so obviously there's a lot of familiarity and and quite frankly just connective tissue from a schematic standpoint between the two who has the advantage in this matchup? The Jet fans got a taste of it with Mike McDaniel. Again, Robert Sala and Mike McDaniel had seven years spent together with all their systems, and Jets won out, but a lot of other factors played into that. What about this one? Who who is there an advantage? Do they they're both so familiar with each other that there's no advantage? What what say you? What what's your so gut say? Are you asking from a coaching perspective who has the advantage they're here? Kind or? of like both because I think they both know each other. So like they're hmm. not, I don't feel like there's a lot of surprises from offense to defense or defense to offense because it seems like there's a lot of connective tissue. More so probably Matt LaFleur, Mike LaFleur, and Roberts are obviously knowing both Matt and Mike very well. It seems like perhaps Roberts kind of knows what's coming in a sense. Again, it's Aaron Rodgers, so you know you can know right. whatever you want, and Aaron Rodgers is going to ball out. But I'm just interested in that connective tissue between the two of like who could potentially have the advantage of knowing each other so well. Yeah, I think that's the part of it. So Rodgers is the X factor. I had talked about how there's less runs because maybe Rodgers isn't playing hero ball and, and mm -hmm. calling these passes on the RPOs. Well, I think that's also the answer. So Salah can know what might be happening, but it's Rodgers that's making the decision. Right. And how many quarterbacks do you trust in the entire league to make the correct decision? I think Rodgers is among the three or four at most. I know, again, this is him playing poorly through the first start of the season. I still would trust him with my life to make the correct calls. Again, last week against the Giants, Alan Lazard, single coverage. I understand why he would target that ball got batted down and you get the slant onto the left, fine. But that I get that choice, and it's Aaron Rodgers doing that for the course of the game. If Aaron Rodgers is playing within himself and within the scheme and understanding what the defense is able to do, and I think back to last week when uh, the Giants had just went down, even with Saquon Barkley out as the Matt Breida and the uh, crossing route and rollout offense that drove down the field, tied the ball game up, it was a three straight, a three and out because he threw three deep balls like that. That can't happen. If that happens against a team like the Jets, we will lose. Like that, that there is a lack of understanding that is so atypical of Rodgers, which is why I just don't think that's going to occur. So it's weird you ask about the coaching staff, and I think they they are like so in lockstep and are so aware of one another that really the difference, the hinge of it, becomes what does Rodgers do with this offense? Because Salah can't. There's nobody. Salah, who I think I still think is a good a good coach and certainly a good defensive coordinator there's nothing you can do when Aaron Rodgers is making the correct play every time. It's just, will he continue to make the correct play? Uh, two quickies here, and uh, before we get you out of here, first off, uh, Joe, answer me this. This uh, lead me into my other question. Uh, as a season ticket holder, as you mentioned, how many games have you been at Lambeau Field in your life? Oh, I've lost count. I would say I'm I'm at least at uh, triple, uh, maybe I'm close to triple digits. I'd say like 75, 80. I, okay. You know, when, like, so I've been going to since I was eight. Uh, I would say really middle school all the way through most of college, I was going to at least four a game uh, or four a season. So 
Yeah, it, I mean, there. I've always told people there are two places on this earth that I feel most relaxed. One is on the soccer field, and two is at Lambeau Field. There's there's something different. The atmosphere is different there. I don't care if it's Titans, Packers, Jets, Packers, Bears, Packers. Lambo Lambo is a special place, and the cool part, like you mentioned, it's a special place for everybody. And I think Packers fans understand that. Maybe not so much the Bears and Vikings, but uh, any any like non divisional opponent coming into Lambo, we understand this is an experience for everybody else, and it's always been. Um, my, you know, I've always been proud of the fans in that sense because they're respecting of, of the people that are here to embrace them like we all are. So you've kind of answered it a little bit there, but I, I still have to ask again, an iconic place, Lambeau Field, the mm -hmm. Lambeau Leap and all of it, like to someone like the Jets and Packers who don't play that often. Again, we have these yeah. couple of faint memories uh, just because of how the NFL schedule makers work and the opposite conferences and things of that nature. Let me just ask you, what taste can you give for Jet fans who are maybe, I, I know several are going to be in attendance, so awesome for the tailgating and all that, but for those who won't be there, or and even for the ones who will be there, what is the taste of Lambeau Field? What is that like, the atmosphere, everything that's going to be entailed? In, and again, for Jet fans, Packers are used to this because Packers, Super Bowl champions with Aaron Rodgers, the WWE Championship, all that stuff. Like The Packers have been in the spotlight for a while, but the Jets being in America's Game of the Week, which it is for Fox now, a Jet fan aren't used to that so when they got that little nugget earlier this week right Packers like of course we are like Jetford's like whoa we're, <laughs> whoa this is cool man we're in the Fox game of the week we're at Lambeau like I think there is that wow factor among Jet fans and then it mattering not like not the Jets trotting in here at 0 and 5 or 1 and 4 like right. 3 and 2 and they have a different moxie than they would have so what is Lambeau field like what can you describe it to Jet fans who are either going and or those who are going to be watching to give them the the full taste of the experience so I guess I'll say the the just real quick with the game of the week for Fox like a, yeah. that's as much of a credit to Zach Wilson and Brees Hall and really the right. front office of the Jets to build a team that can be this competent. Like, again, I, I think this is going to be a real struggle. Uh, we had done this on the X's and O's and wins and losses at the beginning of the season. Yeah, of course, the Packers beat the Jets. There has <laughs> been real there has been a real improvement from Zach Wilson and Brees Hall was an excellent selection. But the, I think the organization of the Jets knows what they are and wants to be. Maybe they can't quite execute it perfectly, but that's so different than what we've been able for the past decade, right? And that's that's where it's so kudos to the Jets in that regard. If you are going to uh, Lambo yourself and you're a Jets fan, get, don't be afraid of the fans. Again, I think we are all appreciative of you guys being able to be there and uh, embrace Lambo. Like, I think it's a special thing. The the Packers were one of the last teams to travel to London, right? This is the, the fifth of the mm -hmm. final year that right. they had to do that. There, there have been so much pushback for the Packers to not lose the home game. They are technically the home team against the Giants. It's because the entire city of Green Bay is economically driven by the Packers. You'll have the game, right? It'll finish at around six or seven. Okay, great. Maybe you're flying back to New York a little bit later on uh, Sunday night or Monday morning, whatever else there will be people in the bars until two or three at night. And we'll just be talking Packers the entire time. And it's not just like one or two, it's the surrounding 30 blocks of Lambeau field packed to the gills with Packers fans. And I think that's kind of the cool part, not the, the drinking the bars thing necessarily, but it is just the, the devotion of the fans. And I think uh, of, of what the team is and what the city is and what it means to them. So that, that part, you're going to go there and you'll see, you'll see the tailgating. You'll see really what has been um, a refined and defined, uh, Lambeau Field experience over the last 10 years or so. It's been it's been an effort. I mean, I think for most of us here in Green Bay and, and the Wisconsin area, they're trying to get the Super Bowl or trying to get the NFL draft. Like, there's been a reason why there's there's been a big improvement overall that whole area. But I think it's only helped the uh, user experience and the people that are there. And then also just if you're in the stadium, I, like if you have time, um, I really think like the the, the pro football. Uh, tour is always a really cool thing. Not because you just see the history of the Packers, but I think they do a really good job of presenting the history of the NFL because the Packers have been around so long. Um, I, I maybe maybe that is like the fandom of me coming into, it, but it is one of those things that I recommend to anybody that comes to Lambo and has time to be able to do one of those tours. Wow, that sounds really cool. And again, that's uh, it's on the bucket list to go there. And how could it not be with such an iconic place and a, and just iconic franchise, obviously, and everything that's connected? We end it the same way, Joe, every time. And, uh, you know, I'm pretty sure every guest that has joined the show so far of every expert coming on the other side has picked their own team. So I imagine yeah. that's going to continue. And, and that's just Andy. I, I'm fine with it either way. But what is your prediction? What's your crystal ball for this? Because I remember doing these shows in the past when the 
Jets are not very good. And they're like, yeah, 48-3 in 13. <laughs> right. and, and so, and I just would go, well, okay, I guess that makes sense. But now it just feels, it's really cool to get people on here and they're predicting competitive matches and giving us this. And you're like, wow, that maybe this can happen. Is that the same sense you're getting for this one? Again, Jets, Packers, America's Game of the Week, and all this other fun jazz on Sunday. What's your crystal ball prediction for this one? Yeah, so I'm going to Uno reverse card you, Paul. You bring on these wonderful guests like myself for, for this particular reason. <laughs> Yeah. Who is going to be the guy that's running the crossing routes for the Jets? Is it Elijah Moore? Is it Garrett mm. Wilson? I think Corey Davis on the outside, right? Like, answer me that question. I think I might have a better answer overall for yours. Yeah. You know, that's funny that you asked that. It's just because, like, if you look at the analytics, right, Elijah Moore's run the most routes. The only other person that's right up there with him is, unfortunately, Alan Robinson, who has been able to convert <laughs> on any of that. I just I read that in the athletic that. yesterday, which is kind of sad. I just was able to finally trade him in our league. We'll talk about that on Friday. Thank goodness. <laughs> uh, so uh, I can't believe if anyone took him. That's phenomenal. Uh, but uh, it's probably going to be Garrett Wilson, to be honest with you. Elijah Moore, in a weird way, because of his size, you know, he was a slot guy in college. That's he played both, but slot was his predominant thing. That so that's where you think that he would play. However, they've been forcing him on the outside and giving him these like jump balls, and it's just it's been kind of silly for Michael Floyd. I think he's kind of about smarting and stuff. So Garrett Wilson and his ability to kind of shake, move, and groove and create separation. I think they like using him in the slot from that perspective to get him free. And him and Zach Wilson have not jived yet. And uh, mm. sometimes it hasn't mattered because they've won two in a row. So they haven't figured it out yet, but they're trying to figure it out of getting him in the slot and getting him in unique one-on-one matchups to try to free him up. So that was my concern. Um, we saw last week with the Giants and Packers. I, I don't know if we it's been so long, but like when Daniel Jones was a rookie quarterback, Barry Slayton was his guy. And I have no yes. idea why he's been pushed out of the depth chart the way he has. But you saw that chemistry immediately. If it was Elijah Moore running the slot, running the crossing routes, the Packers allow by far the most uh, yards on crossing patterns in the entire league. It's by like double the next team. It's just, it's an wow. embarrassingly bad number. If it was Elijah Moore, who I think is dynamic after the catch, not that Garrett Wilson's not, but like that Zach Wilson has that chemistry with, I think there'd be some really big concerns for me. But if it is Garrett Wilson, I, I think it's the Packers uh, that can survive. I, I truly believe that's the case. Survive wow. this matchup. I would go let's say like 31 24 27 something like that uh and not that it'll be a backdoor cover by the jets either but it'll be more like packers have to drive down either get mason crosby for that field goal or they, they bleed out the clock type of thing i will give you a bit of gambling stuff here I, whatever the yes, over is yeah. for Brees hall and the rushing yards i would take that uh at least 60 <laughs> plus i also think and this has been a decade-long problem for the packers too yeah. receiving running backs cannot be figured out by the Packers. They, they've they never had the personnel, to be fair, to cover previously. It was like Blake Martinez and uh, Nick Barnett who are trying to run out there right. with Matt Forte and stuff. So, yes, Quay Walker and Devondre Campbell are going to be better at that. But I do think Michael Carter, if you say over three and a half receptions, that feels like a lock to me. It will be both Michael Carter and Brees Hall who have good games. And you're going to come away from this contest thinking, oh, boy, we have two number one running backs. No, it's just the Packers run defense and the Packers defense <laughs> in general. So just, just dial it back. That's uh, that's great. They do it all, man. Joe bought a little fantasy advice, uh, a little gambling advice. It's all nice. And it's funny. Again, uh, we have another show on Wednesdays and the prediction. They said, hey, Paul, what's your prediction? I'm like, oh, you know, 31, 27 jet. So you, you we're right in the same realm of, of scoring mm -hmm. and everything else. And again, I, I think, uh, you know, jet fans have higher expectations now with how the season's gone. But I'm really hoping in this spotlight, in this opportunity, that the Jets perform well, that it's not just the goose egg. But I think winning two in a row and destroying the Dolphins the way they did, I think quieted a lot of the fear of goose eggs after success. The Jets have really quelled and uh, crushed a lot of those demons, which I think has inspired a lot of Jet fans. And giving them Moxie and Calvin sending it to this game that Jet fans are not familiar with. So uh, Yeah, it, I, I would just say I yeah. think it's less about the Jets uh, performing to expectations. They're going to. They're – I don't know if you're a good team, but you're not a bad team. And that, that that's a nice thing. That's that's where we're at right now. Like, I think right. that you're trending towards being a good team. The Jets will perform the way they are. Is Are the Packers going to perform up to the expectations we think, or are they going to continue to under-deliver? That's the answer to this question. That's the, the, If you have the answer, if you know what it is, that's what dictates this game. Because the Jets are going to be the Jets. I think they're going to be good. It's whether the Packers should be better.
And uh, Joe, let's finish it off with, uh, of course, our platform here of uh, our uh, all of our listeners that have been joining us uh, throughout this series of thousands of you. We really appreciate it. Again, like the video, hit subscribe, and of course, follow Joe on Twitter at JB Fantasy Sports. You see it right there uh, underneath that handsome mug. But uh, Joe, uh, what else uh, can you promote uh, before we uh, get you out of here where people can, uh, who may not be familiar with your work, where they can find your work and uh, where they can, of course, uh, hear that uh, sexy voice of yours on Sirius XM Radio. Yeah, you mentioned it, SiriusXM, uh, every Friday with my co-host Mario Puig, who really is the, the muscle and the brain of the show. Uh, I call myself a disciple of Mario Puig. What he says goes. So a lot of my thoughts and feelings, it's, it's, it's his call. So uh, we have that 8 p.m. Eastern every every Friday uh, on SiriusXM channel 88. Uh, I do the Tuesday Road Wire podcast specifically targeting waiver wire pickups with my co-host Jake Latarski. That's been a great one. I think we've really caught our stride this season and been in on a lot of guys before they had popped off. Uh, we had the Taysom Hill conundrum this week. We discussed what you'd be trading for Kenneth Walker, things like that. If you are into fantasy, uh, anywhere you listen to your podcast, Rotowire, NFL podcast, uh, get to cover there from the fantasy perspective too. And I do a number of different radio hits, not just with you, but uh, yes. across the nation. I try to tweet them out as best I can at JB Fantasy Sports. And I really try to answer as many questions as I get to from the users out there. Um, fantasy sports is a fun thing. It's not meant to be stressful. I'm meant to make it fun for you. That's my job. That's what I'm meant to take the stress from you. So uh, if there's anything else I like to say, I, I could be the guy you can blame uh, when things go wrong. That's that's what my job is. And I love doing each and every day. So it's been great talk with you. It's great talking every Friday, uh, Paul. And I'm, I'm happy to be on the show. It's been It's been fantastic. A hundred percent. And two nuggets here. First off, Joe is a hundred percent right. If you tweet at him at JB fantasy sports, he answers all your questions, guys. So if you have fantasy start sits or whatever really is revving your engine on the fantasy world, feel free to tweet at Joe and he'll answer it for you. And I think the other part of it is Joe is it's 2022. I mean, fantasy is a fabric of football today. People right. watch NFL football based on just their fantasy lineups and vested mm -hmm. interest in different ways. It's not just Jets and Packers fan watching the, you know, the Jets Packers game. They're gonna be like, oh, man, I got Brees all man. I need this guy to go off so i just love that the world has evolved and allowed even more casual fans even if you want to call them that that it, uh, have taken up football that wouldn't have otherwise so there's my uh, psa for the day everybody uh love it it's awesome joe thank you so much for taking the time and this was a lot of fun yeah thanks for having me on paul there he is, uh, Joe Bartle. You can follow him on Twitter at JB Fantasy Sports, our fantasy football roto wire expert. And he joins us every Friday at uh, 10 30 on the Man Shout Show, Me Boy Green. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the game on Sunday. A little Jets Packers action. Thanks, everybody. Peace out.